Here's a story that I couldn't wait to get on air to talk about. Mike Bloomberg is exploiting prison labor to make his campaign phone calls. <laughs> now, there are updates to this story, so hang in there, but let me give you some of the information. This is The Intercept reporting. Former New York City mayor and multi-billionaire Democratic presidential candidate Mike Bloomberg used prison labor to make campaign calls. Through a third-party vendor, the Mike Bloomberg 2020 campaign contracted New Jersey-based call center company Procom, which runs call centers in New Jersey and Oklahoma. Two of the call centers in Oklahoma are operated out-of-state prisons. In at least one of the prisons, incarcerated people were contracted to make calls on behalf of the Bloomberg campaign. Now, they, of course, responded to this and said, hey, we had no idea that this was going on. And now that we know it, we're flat out going to cut ties with this company. We're going to cut, cut ties and tell them, damn, that's kind of messed up that you're using that labor. We don't support that labor by any stretch of the imagination. Um, now, the ProCom founder, that's the call company, their uh, co-founder, said that he pays the Oklahoma minimum wage of $7.25 an hour to the Oklahoma Department of Corrections. So therefore, hey, don't, you know, look away. There's no scandal here. I'm paying minimum wage. So everybody can piss off with all of your outrage. Um, but the part that <laughs> that some outlets are, probably aren't reporting is the second half of that, which is then the Department of Corrections turns around and prisoners only get anywhere from $20 to $27 per month. So the company may pay, you know, the Department of Corrections $7.25 an hour for their labor, but only $20 to $27 a month is getting to the actual uh, prisoners. So, you know, they're getting something, but it's way under minimum wage because they're working normal hours, way under minimum wage. And uh, clearly, this is an example of prison labor being exploited. Now, uh, there actually is... It is allowed in this country. Slavery is banned, except in cases of if somebody's incarcerated. Then, you know, you could basically force them to do labor. But, on this one, I have to agree with uh, my good friend Kanye West, <laughs> where he made this a big thing recently, and he was like, that's insane that we still have that. We have slavery behind, you know, bars. Yeah, I think that is kind of crazy. And, you know, I'm, I like to consider myself, I'm tough on crime, if the crime should be a crime. So, in other words, free all the nonviolent drug offenders, legalize tax and regulate drugs. But if somebody's in there for some sort of violent crime, somebody committed murder or rape or fill in the blank with whatever egregious thing you could think of, well, I'm tough on that kind of crime. But, listen, even me, and I don't, I don't even know if these are all violent criminals, or probably not, probably have a lot of nonviolent offenders who are in the call center. But... Even me, I say no way to like force labor or drastically underpaid labor behind uh, prison bars. So, you know, do I believe the Bloomberg campaign when they say we actually didn't know that this company that we contracted with was using that labor? I actually do believe them. I do believe them. I think that um, had they known in advance, they probably just picked the cheapest vendor and then come to find out after. Oh, wow. No wonder why they're so cheap. They're exploiting prison labor. Um, so I believe them when they say that. However, and this is a big however, this is a big but. I like big buts and I cannot lie. Um, what this shows is no grassroots support for Michael Bloomberg. And that's something that everybody knew anyway. But this really, I mean, ugh, rub salt in that wound, son. <laughs> rub it in all day long. Um, that's what this is. Because... I don't know about you guys. I'm a I'm a monthly donor to Bernie, and um, I'm always getting those like text messages from the Bernie campaign and calls from the Bernie campaign and whatnot. Now I don't know the situation. I know that everybody who officially works for the Bernie campaign gets paid, but I think these are people who are just volunteers to canvas and make phone calls and text. Now correct me if I'm wrong. Again, everybody who's an official employee of the Bernie Sanders campaign. Um, they get paid, and they get paid a living wage, by the way. He was the first to do that as well, pay the people in his campaign a living wage. 
But if somebody's texting and calling, I think a lot of people are doing that on their own volition just because they want to, because they want to try to get this guy elected. And, you know, Bernie Sanders has a grassroots army. He has a grassroots army behind him, shattering, you know, small dollar fundraising records. Millions of small individual donors. So that's what he's got going on. Michael Bloomberg, on the other hand, is like, okay, I need somebody to make phone calls for my campaign. Nobody wants to do that. So let's contract with the cheapest company possible. And oh, oops, turns out the cheapest company is exploiting prison labor. And uh, our bad, we didn't know about it. So again, to their, I believe them when they say they didn't know about it. And I'm happy that they cut ties with the company. Um, but again, I think the main takeaway from this story is not necessarily the immorality or amorality of Bloomberg, which, by the way, I still do think he's either immoral or amoral. <laughs> um, it's the fact that there's a giant gap for grassroots support. Because this guy hopped in the race late. He's buying his way into the race. He's skipping the first four contests, which I think is disrespectful. By the way, he's doing that because he, he views it as a necessity. If he thought he had a chance in those states, he would, he would jump in and, and he would have registered for those states, but he didn't. So that means he knows, like, okay, it's it's too late. I'm gonna. I'm, there's no way I'm gonna do well in any of those states. So what am I gonna do? I'll just try to buy the rest of the way. I'll try to buy my way through Super Tuesday. He's you know carpet bombing the airways with over a hundred billion dollars in ads. By the way, number two in um in ad money is Tom Steyer. He's right behind Bloomberg. And guess what? Those are the two billionaires. So. And here's a point somebody made on Twitter the other day, which really stopped me in my tracks because I'm mad I didn't think about it because it's so simple but so true. He spent over $100 million on campaign ads so far. Imagine what he could have done with that money if he just wanted to try to make a difference for the better. And he's not done yet, guys. I mean, who knows how much he's going to spend when all is said and done. Is he going to spend like $2 billion trying to get himself elected? Could be. Could be. He could spend $2 billion trying to get himself elected. Now, just imagine if he took that $2 billion and he, you know, I don't know, tried to put that into ending homelessness, for example. I don't know how much it would cost to end homelessness, but think about how many people would have a roof over their head, their heads, if he took that $2 billion and said, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to build housing for the poor. I mean, the amount of good that could be done with all this money, but instead he's effectively lighting it on fire trying to get himself elected. And buying his way into a race, which is really, in a weird roundabout way, just showing how much of an oligarchy we are. Now, uh, again, I still, I don't think he has that much of a chance, but he, let's just keep it real, man. He's bought 5% in the polls. That's what he's at right now, about, thereabouts. 5%. Carpet bombing the airwaves with waves. A guy who otherwise would have 0% has 5%. And that's not on the power of his ideas. That's on, you know, just I'm going to force my way into the room and you're going to take me seriously because you have no choice but to take me seriously because I'm putting myself in front of you nonstop because I have the funds to do so. You know, and it just so happens that, and you guys know this if you listen to the show for a long time, over 90% of the time, the person who raises the most money ends up winning elections. Over 90% of the time. Now, when it comes to the presidential election, those numbers get skewed a little bit because, you know, as my friend Jank Uger points out, um, you get a lot of free media when you run for president in many instances. So, uh, you know, there's more of a chance where even if you're like more underfunded, you could still win in a presidential race. But the over 90 percent number is actually for Congress. And what does that tell you when over 90 percent of the time the person that raises the most money wins? What does that Princeton study tell you? The Princeton study, which found that if you're in the bottom roughly 80% of voters, there's no correlation between what you want in the opinion polls and what gets implemented into law and what policies get passed. There's no correlation. The correlation begins with like about the top 10%, where whatever you want is much more likely to become law. What does that tell you? These are all like little clues and hints that are being dropped like, oh, by the way, we function more. And this is what the Princeton study outright said. We function more as an oligarchy than a democracy. And I get it, we're, you know, for everybody, oh, we're a republic. We're a constitutional republic and a representative democracy. We're both of those things. So, and we function more like an oligarchy or a kleptocracy or a plutocracy. So, um, it's just, it's so weird to see it unfolding in such a brazen way in front of you. 
where this guy would be at 0% if it wasn't for his over $100 million he carpet bombed the airways with. He would be at 0%. Instead, now he's at 5%. The fact that he could just leapfrog all, all these people who've been campaigning really hard and working really hard from day one, that should upset you. And, you know, the prison labor story is not... Because I think a lot of people are just going to use this to, to just bash him over the head with the fact that they use prison labor. And that is bad. Don't get me wrong. But I believe them when they say, oh, I, di I didn't, we didn't know about it. We just contracted with the company and, you know, we assumed that they had better business practices. And they said, oh, from now on, we'll vet the companies better or whatever. But to me, the real takeaway here is not that. The real takeaway is there's no grassroots support there. So people have to literally be forced to pretend to support Bloomberg and make phone calls for his campaign. And that says a lot about his candidacy now, doesn't it?